Hello. I've said previously that if you want to be a good runner, you've got to do lots and lots of running and lots of training. And I've given some of my experiences of how I managed to squeeze training runs into a busy lifestyle. But of course, there's more to it than that. If you want to be a good runner, you've got to do good training. But what is good training? Whose advice should you take? Whose program should you follow? When I started taking running seriously in the 1970s and I wanted to be a track runner, the training of New Zealand coach Arthur Lydiard was the, was the thing to follow. Everybody told me this was the way to do it because he'd had so much success. Lydiard had coached Peter Snell to an Olympic 800 meter gold medal in the um, Rome Olympics of 1960. He'd also coached the New Zealand winner of the 5,000 metres in the same Olympics, Murray Halberg. As you can see, Murray Halberg has a withered left arm, which happened in a rugby accident when he was 17. He could have qualified nowadays for the Paralympics, but under Arthur Lydiard's tutelage and advice and direction, he became Olympic 5,000 metre champion. Peter Snell went on four years later in the Tokyo Olympics of 1964 to retain his 800 metre gold medal and he also, a few days later, running his sixth race in eight days, won the 1500 metre gold medal. And when you win an Olympic 1500 metre title by this sort of margin as the 800 metre champion, people really take notice. And you may notice also behind him is another New Zealander, coached by Arthur Lydiard, John Davis, who took the bronze medal in this same race. Everyone could clearly see that Lydiard's methods were working at the very highest level. His methods were very specific and they were designed to bring an athlete to a peak of fitness for the biggest races of the track season. It can best be demonstrated by this diagram. An important part of his process was what he called marathon conditioning, which involved covering a lot of miles every week, including one long run. He had people like Peter Snell, an 800 metre Olympic champion, doing 22 mile runs each week and about 100 miles in each week. And he, he suggested that it should be eight to 10 weeks, but it, uh, it could be longer. After that, when all his athletes had developed plenty of aerobic conditioning and strength and endurance. They moved into a transition phase of hill resistance training for about four weeks. This involved lots of running quickly uphill with a sort of a springing motion. This developed strength again and uh, aerobic capacity. It also involved uh, more strenuous actions. Running fast uphill requires a high knee lift and a strong push from the foot as you take off, two actions which are essential for very fast running on the track. After the hill resistance, it was a phase of four weeks of what was called speed development, which was transitioning again into running faster, and then sharper still in the sharpening phase, where you're getting, starting to run very fast, and then finally into a peaking phase, the sharpening and the peaking phase would involve some anaerobic training where running very fast with short recoveries to develop a peak. And at the end of the peak, it would be that if you timed it correctly, you'd be in the greatest shape of your life to run the biggest race of your life. You may have noticed that the hill resistance and the speed development, the sharpening and the peaking add up to a total of 14 weeks of preparation for a big race. But there are 52 weeks in a year what are we supposed to do with the other 38? The consensus at the time seemed to be that well, you just added more and more time to the marathon conditioning. And I invariably spent just about six months of the winter doing mainly long runs without very much speed work to it. I followed this schedule for a number of years with limited success. I was doing okay, but I had a, a number of problems. First of all, I was often injured at the beginning of the hill training and, and speed development phases. I'd get injuries in my calf muscles and Achilles tendons when I started putting them through much greater range of movement and more stress than I had done so for a period of time. I also, it also took me a long time to 
a long time during the season to develop my top speed, which isn't very fast to start with. And also I'd be racing 5k races on the track and I'd be up with the leaders for 8, 9, 10 laps and then just fade a bit. I just wasn't able to maintain the speed I'd been running. I wondered whether it was because I just wasn't strong enough to maintain it or I wasn't fast enough to cope comfortably with the speed we were racing at. Eventually, and it took me a long time, I realised this thing just wasn't working for me and I needed to change. This was at the same time as I was working on my inner psychology, which I've discussed in a, another video. So I was doing a lot of thinking about where my running was going. And I realised fairly obviously that Peter Snell was a very, very different athlete to me. He was fast. He had lots of basic speed. He could run 800 metres 12 seconds faster than I could. And so he'd, Lydiard had been really successful with him because he'd realised what great speed he had and he'd given him lots of endurance training to make him strong enough to be able to maintain that speed during a series of track races and, and be able to still fully use his speed at the end of a race. So he'd combined his natural speed with strength training. I was doing all that endurance and aerobic training but didn't have the speed. That was where I was going wrong. To avoid injury I realised that I needed to keep my legs used to running pretty quickly all year round so they didn't suffer a sudden stress they weren't used to. And I realised that the problem with fading in the latter stages of 5k races on the track wasn't to do with lack of strength or speed. You see, I'd been thinking in the past that I'd become very, very strong and then work on being really, really fast, put the two together and I'd be able to race quickly. But I was missing an important thing. I wasn't doing any training at the pace I was racing at. I needed to do race pace training all year round. And when I started to do that, I had a long spell without any injuries and the problem of fading in races disappeared, I became better and better. I still used the peaking process advocated by Lydiard at certain times, and I became quite good at it and peaked successfully for my biggest races. But I was able to do so because now I had a base of being comfortable at my 10k race pace, instead of previously trying to raise myself up from months of mileage with very little fast running in it. So I used the parts of Lydiard training that worked for me and I altered the ones that didn't. I just wish I'd done it sooner. So when I'm asked what's the best training for a distance runner, the answer to that is the training that works best for you. And you find that out by trying different approaches and see which one works and by knowing your strengths and weaknesses. But if you get it right you may surprise yourself and perhaps other people too.